Good evening, my beloved. It is so good to be back with you again this week. Uh, we've had an exciting weekend, uh, the past weekend, and we're glad to be back with you again. Uh, on a quick note, I want to say that um, we're getting ready to vote, and I feel compelled to say to encourage you, whatever you do, to vote in the elections. Um, we are in a place in our nation that everybody needs to take part in order for our nation to rise to the occasion. So I'm encouraging you to go out and vote and vote your heart. Amen. Okay, we're here again. And like I said, we, we are in the book of James continuing there. And we will be coming from the third chapter tonight. So get your Bible and get ready because we will be in the third chapter of the book of James. Amen. So we, as always, we don't like to start trying to do anything without asking help from the Holy Spirit. So we're going to look to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we come right now in the name of Jesus. We honor and praise you, God, because of who you are. We love you, Lord, and we praise you. We adore you. We give you all the glory because all the glory goes to you. I pray, oh God, that as we go through this lesson that you would speak through me, Holy Spirit, and that we will all learn to be the better, the people that you have created us to be. You've already told us that we're made in your image, and so we have the probability of being all that you've already desired and designed us to be. I pray that as this word goes forth, that it would have an impact on the life of the hearers as it had on the, the teacher, myself. Thank you for this awesome opportunity, and may you be blessed by what transpires here tonight. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, again, we're in the book of James. We're down to the third chapter. Uh, the first couple of chapters we covered. And in the first chapter, we talked about, uh, in, the, in the last chapter, we talked about being partial, about partiality. And we also talked about faith without works. And so James, uh, in that chapter, he condemned the Jews' attitude of having faith without works. And he, um, and he continues here in the third chapter believing that with that kind of attitude that you can just uh, determine and work your way into heaven with that kind of attitude that that would most likely be people with that kind of attitude would most likely be dogmatic in their doctrine and in their teaching and very arrogant in a, in a way and have an arrogant approach to how they teach because they're feeling some kind of way like I'm in control of this and so this chapter continues this warning about the arrogance of, of as it relates to our tongue as we teach. Because when we get into the uh, third chapter, the very first verse, and we're going to spend a minute there, the very first verse talks about not being many teachers. And so what we're going to do for this study tonight, we're going to go uh, virtually verse by verse because it's so important that we don't miss anything. And as the impact of the very first verse in and of itself, lends itself to some time for us to explain to you how important the tongue is in our teaching. And I don't mean your linguistic skills. I'm talking about your attitude as you teach. Amen? And so I hope you have your Bibles by now. And as we all know, and for those who may be just now tuning in, we teach from the New King James. Amen? And so verse 3 begins with, My brethren, which means he's talking to us, those of us on the household of faith. He says, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. So what is James saying here? James appealed to the believers that it's necessary to put and, and our outward actions have to add up with our inward faith. And that kind of faith will accomplish nothing. But in this lesson, he gives advice about how we control our tongue. Because even in teaching, because as he said in the earlier chapters, Faith without good works is dead, and good works include being able to control your tongue as you are teaching. And so what does that mean? That means that you don't be eager to take the bull by the horns, and as you teach, you start telling people uh, what their faults are and having people to believe that uh, it's your way and that you know better than everybody else. That's not what teaching is. And when we uh, teach uh, the Bible, uh, we should know going in that it's God's word and not our word. 
And it's good to put your emphasis on things, but you don't use uh, your, your ability to talk or your tongue, since we're talking about the tongue, you don't use your tongue to judge other people. Um, some teachers make their own uh, ideas a standard for, for as, they, as they're teaching, and they judge others. In, 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 semi, in ways like that. And so we don't condemn our find fault or criticize people when we're teaching because it's the Bible is not to be brought to up our personal standards as a teacher, but the standards that God has set in the word. And so even as teachers, James is telling us that uh, our judging others, if we do that, it's going to make our judgment even greater. So what the, the bottom line is, when you are teaching, teach the word. And like I said, it's good to put emphasis in it. And even if you're adding your input, say this is what I believe. Don't put something in the Bible that's not in the Bible. My brother used to tell me, stay in Bible land. And so that's what we, uh, what I impress upon you to do, that if you're going to be a teacher, it's not your standards or how you feel. It's about what the Word of God says. Specifically, you are to teach what God says. And again, if you're going to add your opinion, say, this is my opinion, but this is not, this is not uh, written in the, in the word. This is my opinion. Make it understandably and clear that it's your opinion about something. But stay as close to the word as you can and whatever you do. Don't make people feel small. There's nothing worse than sitting in a classroom and the teacher has this arrogant attitude that they know everything and that you are there there to uh, minimize you and your knowledge. So never make people feel small when you're teaching. You are to embrace them. You are to, to, to let them know that we're all in the same this thing together, all of us. And there's one commonality in all of us, and that is at the foot of the cross where all of us are equal. And God has no big eyes and little U's. And so as you teach, don't give off this arrogant attitude that you're all that and a piece of cheesecake because believe me, you're not. So just teach the word of God and teach it out of humility because humility is what God is looking for. He said he's looking for an humble and contrite spirit. And so that simply means that God is looking for someone who, who is humble in their spirit and know that they're still growing. Because as long as we are alive and well on this earth, we will never get to the point where we know everything. So don't give people the impression that you do. And whatever you do, don't ever make anybody feel small under your teaching. That is not what God intends for us to do. Help all of us to know that we're growing in this together. And if, you are, if you're really uh, teaching, teaching, you grow along with your students because you can go over a lesson one, one year and you go back to that same lesson a year later, God will reveal more things to you then than he did the first time. So you're still growing. So don't use your tongue to criticize and make people feel less than or, or give them the impression that you got all the answers. Because believe me, brother and sister, we do not. So that's what James is saying. He says, uh, uh, be not many of you become teachers. Because you, we, I include myself because I'm a teacher, we shall receive a stricter judgment. So uh, our judging others will make our own judgment the more strict and severe when we do, when we use our status and our position as a teacher to uh, make people feel less than or to say things that are unkind to people. Amen. All right, now let's go to verse two. It says, for we all stumble in many things. That's a reality for all of us. We all stumble in many things. If anyone does not stumble in word, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Now, I want to key in on that word perfect. That word perfect here does not mean that you have no faults. It doesn't mean that you've reached this point in your life where you are so close to God, so you, cannot, you can just, you know, you, you're just there. And that you are perfect and you know you do no wrong, you say no wrong, you think you're just perfect. That's not what that perfect means. This word perfect here, the Greek word for it, and I'm gonna try and pronounce it, is teleos, and it means full grown or of age. Or a clearer meaning is that it means that you may not be, not that you currently, that you are not totally, but you may not be morally lacking. In other words, it means that uh, you are expressing 
in your life and in your language. You are expressing ethical standards. That's what that perfect means, is that you are trying your best to be the best that you can be. But it does not mean that you are without fault and that you have arrived. It just means that you are morally, you are not morally liking and that you are expressing yourself and in your, in your lifestyle, uh, you express ethical standards, standards of God in your lifestyle. That's what that perfect means. And it says, if anyone does not stumble in word, and in, in that in word there, that means that it means that you are careful about what you say, you're careful about how you say it. And so, to, and, and as you do that, you are embracing moral standards in the way you in the way you talk, in the way you talk to people, in the way you talk with people. And there's a difference in talking to people and with people, but we'll get to that later. And so we're still talking about the tongue and how important it is uh, that we our language, our, our language really depicts our character, if we believe it or not, the way we address things, the way we talk to people that your character comes out in your, in your language. So we'll get to that as, as part of this lesson as well. And now here's, here comes the good stuff. And this is where we're going to hang our hats for a few minutes here too. Yeah, we have time. Verse number three, we're going to put three and four. Um, we're going to put three and four together because it, it, it calls for that. Okay. It says, indeed, we put bits in, this is, this is how powerful the tongue is. We put bits in horses' mouths that they may obey us, and we turn their whole body. And he goes on to say, look also at ships. Although they are so large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a very small rudder wherever the pilot desires. And we're going to include verse 5. Even so, the tongue is a little member and boasts of great things. See how great a forest a little fire kindles. Okay, let's deal with that. It simply means that when we, when we don't control our tongue, it's a small part of our body, but when we don't control it, we think more of ourselves than we ought to think. Our mistakes and our offenses can cause a lot of hurt to people. Because one thing about words, when they leave your mouth, you cannot bring them back. And you will say, well, I didn't mean that. Well, no, the, it depends on how the person receives what you're saying. And, and, and again, it, it, um, we have to learn to, to, before we speak, to think about what we're going to say. Because even though this tongue is really, really small, it, it, it is, it, it'll, it'll offend people. You can say things. You can hurt people. You can cut people. And so when, and one thing about uh, uh, word, word hurt when, you, when there's a physical scar, I think I've said this before, when there's a physical scar, you can see the healing process when the, when the scalp takes over and then the healing place is, comes back and, and you'll know that for, some, for the most part the scars heal. But when someone's hurt on the inside, when a scar has been caused on the inside of a person's in their heart, you don't know how deep that goes. And so we need to be careful because this little tongue in our mouth can set a whole community on fire. It can cause all kind of confusion in a church. It can cause confusion in a marriage. It can cause confusion in a family. When we don't take the time to judge ourselves, and then the examples that they give here, uh, these comparisons show how something that's as small as a rudder for a ship and, and the bits that you put in the horse's mouth, it's little, but it has a lot of power. A lot of power. And so, well, uh, we should learn uh, to make our, our tongues, to realize our tongue is small, but it, there's a lot of power there. And it, it can change, it can set a whole lot of things in motion. And it would take sometimes months and years for, things, for people to heal from the things that have been said by this tongue. So it, it just puts us in a place where uh, the tongue is called in verse five, I think it's called one of the verse six is called a world of iniquity. Let's read verse six. He says, and the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. The tongue is so set among our members that it defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature. And it is set on the fires of hell. So what does that mean? That simply means that, uh, the uncontrolled tongue can do a whole lot of terrible things. It means that before you speak, 
remember that your you that your words are like fire. And if you've ever seen a fire that's raging and it just goes from limb to limb, from person to house to house, a fire is very destructive. Well, that's what your tongue is being compared to. And so, and the whole, when you say things, it's not just your words, your whole, it includes your whole body, you know. And so, in, in a way, and um, you, you're drawn into sin and to guilt by the things that you say, all with this little tongue that's in our mouth. So what does it say? The devil is called a liar and a murderer and an accuser of the brother. And whenever you use your tongue to follow that creed uh, in any of those ways, you set on the fires of hell. That's what that means. Let's go in our Bibles, first of all. Let's, let's go here for a minute. Let's go to Psalm 39.1. Turn back to Psalm 39.1. Okay, 27. I thought I had it marked. Okay. Okay. This is David talking. And this is this is what we have to the conclusion that we have to come to about our tongue. And this is a declaration that will help us to think before we speak. And David is writing, he says, I will guard my ways lest I sin with my tongue. I will restrain my mouth with a muzzle while the wicked are before me. So in the word, David is saying, I'm, I'm going to guard my ways. And how do I do that? By restraining my tongue, by restraining what I say. That's going to employ a goodness on my part and kindness on my part. And then also, let's look at, there's one more scripture I want us to check out. Um, let's look at James 4.11, since we're close to James. It says, James 4.11 says, do not speak evil of one another, brethren. He who speaks evil of a brother and judges his brother speaks evil of the law and judges the law. But if you judge the law, you are not a doer of the law, but a judge. And so James is saying, don't speak evil of anybody. Don't, don't let that be your reputation, that you're crude and you're rude, you're rude and you don't think about other people's feelings. And then let's go to one more scripture. Um, uh, Ecclesiastes 5, verse 6 and 7. So uh, Ecclesiastes is a couple of books past Psalms. After Proverbs is Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 6 and 7. And because your, your, your mouth can cause you to sin, and that includes your whole body. And it says, Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes verse five, chapter 5, verse six, uh, verse 6 and 7 says, do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. You know, see, that's what we do. We will say things, and then you say, well, I didn't mean it. Yes, you did. Yes, you did. And, and sometimes people say things, and they try to do it in a joking way, but deep down in their hearts, they meant what they said. And they say, oh, I was just kidding. No, you use comedy as a shield to say what you wanted to say. Let's be real. So the, in order to keep people from being hurt by what you say, just don't, if, if that's your idea of being funny, maybe you shouldn't be funny. Leave the, leave the jokes to the comedians. Amen? And I'll read it again. In verse 6, it says, Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin, nor say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? Go on, number 7. For in the multitude of dreams... And many words, there is also vanity. Read that again, verse number seven. For in the multitude of dreams and many words, there is also vanity, but fear God. Because you see, we're going to have to give an account of all the things we've said when we stand before God. So when you get ready to say something, think about it. Because you're going, whether you're a teacher or just, an, or, or you, it doesn't matter what your profession is, as far as in the, in the household of God or in life, period. You're going to give an account to God for the things you say. That's word. Amen? And one more scripture, and then we'll move on. Uh, Proverbs 13, 3. I want you to get all of these because I want you to see the importance of, um, of how important your tongue is and what you say. Proverbs 13, almost there. Proverbs 13, 3. Are you there? Okay, it says, 
He who guards his mouth preserves his life, but he who opens wide his lips shall have destruction. So what is that saying? You preserve your life. Sometimes what you say can cost you dearly. It can cost you dearly. That will affect your whole life by the things you say. So the simple truth is, as we're going through, through this study on the tongue, is be careful what you say. Be careful how you say it. Because how you say something is just as important as what you say. And, 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 and um, uh, saying the right words at the right time is important. But most important is controlling your desire to say what you shouldn't say. Because sometimes in the heat of an argument, you will, you, you're so fired up till you say things. And then you know when they leave your mouth, it's the wrong thing. You shouldn't have said it. So learn self-control. That's what this is about. Learn self-control. And it's better to sit there and say nothing than take a chance on saying something that will cause pain to other people. That is not of God. That is not of God. Amen? So let us keep going. We've got a few more verses in this lesson. And we're at verse number 8. It said, no, verse number 7. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and creature of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by mankind. We can tame animals, but listen at this. But no man can tame the tongue. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. That in itself ought to get us standing on the right path because it tells us clearly it's a it's an unruly uh little thing full of deadly poison that's what our tongue is that's what james is compared it to and look at verse 9 with it we bless our god and father and with it we curse men hmm, who have been made in the similitude of god out of the same mouth verse 10 out of the same mouth proceeded blessing and cursing my brother these things ought not be so so what is, what is, then is James saying? James is saying then that if we bless God as Father, that should teach us to speak well of other people uh, and, and kindly to everybody because they are made, we're all made in God's image. And so you wouldn't, be, you wouldn't insult God. And so we are made in God's image. And so we need to think about that, um, that if I won't say things about negative things about God, this person is made in God's image, so I should be as kind to that person and think about the fact that I can't do that with them either. And then to talk, it talks about uh, we bless God and Father and we curse men who have been made in the similitude. And it goes, verse 10 says, out of the same mouth proceeds blessing and cursing. My brother, these things ought not be so. But verse 11 goes on to bring it closer to home than that. It says, does a spring send forth fresh water and bitter water from the same opening? Even in nature, God has said it that you can't get fresh water and, 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 and bitter water out of the same well. So if God has set that forth in nature, then that's a clue to us that we should not be blessing God and cursing God out of the same, per, out of the same mouth. It's not, it's not of God to do that. So all these, all these verses that we're going through is simply to impress upon you uh, the, 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 the importance of thinking before you speak, have self-control, and know that uh, self-control is something that's learned. You learn and think before you speak because you don't know how deeply you're cutting someone. And then verse 11 and 12, we're going to close with here. It says, can, verse 12, can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, a grapevine bear figs? Thus, no spring yields both salt, water, and fresh. And so what we just said in a minute ago, a minute ago, is that you are not created to bring forth ugly and good out of the same mouth. That's not how God created us. But it's incumbent upon us to, 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 to understand the effects that your words have on people. That's, that's called responsibility. So you see, we have two things here. We have responsibility and we have self-control. And both of those are learned behaviors. We learn to be responsible. We learn to exercise self-control. And for some of us, it's a greater job than others. But you, And how do you get there? You start practicing it. You practice saying kind things. You practice uh, uh, thinking about your, th your words before you say them. Because believe me, once you say them, they cannot be retracted. 
and you don't know the damage. I'm repeating myself purposely because you don't know the damage that you're doing with your mouth. And that's one of the things that when God says he names the seven things that he hates, gossip is one of them. And how do we gossip? With our mouth. And gossip is named as one of the things that God hates. And he, he says he hates it, anything that sows discord among the brethren. That's what gossip does. So before you decide to gossip about somebody, think about what you're saying. Think about who could be hurt as a result of it. And it's never just one person that you hurt. You also hurt indirectly people that are connected to those people. So it's like a putting a pebble, throwing a pebble in the water and the ripple effect. Your words have a ripple effect in the lives of people. So be very, very careful how you speak to people because that's, that's just as important to how you speak to people. You don't have to be cruel and, and give the impression that you all that, and you, you, you know, you, I'm, I'm me and you're going to listen to me. No, no. Kind words. The Bible talks about kindness and kind words. That's what my mother used to say. You draw more, I'm going to see if I get it right now. You draw more flies with honey than, than vinegar or something along those lines. Anyway, I'm probably, probably quoting it wrong. But in other words, what she was saying is your kind words go much further than harsh words. And if it's your personality that it always be large and in charge and you talk to people like you're way up here and they're way down there, guess who's watching you? Guess who's listening at how you're talking to people? Guess who's listening? And first of all, they know coming from your heart. Because your words, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever is in your heart, that's what you're going to speak. So I hope this lesson has helped some of us. I hope it has helped us to learn how we need to check ourselves. Uh, there's a, a, old, a saying right now that says, check yourself before you wreck yourself. I would advise that. Check yourself before you wreck yourself. Because you're not only wrecking you, you could wreck a whole church, a whole family, a community, like the lies that are going out now about the election being stolen, but I'm going to leave that alone. Um, be careful what you say. Because you can, you, can, you can tear up a lot of things and hurt a lot of people by simply what you say. And we don't even have to go into the part about being a liar. That's also included in this lesson. Because when you lie, Hurt follows lies. So be very careful. Tell the truth. My mother used to say, when you tell the truth, you can go back and tell that truth over and over and over and over again because it's true. But when you lie, you got to remember everything you said, how you said it, who was involved. You got to remember, you got to recreate the thing all over again. And in nine times out of ten, you cannot do it exactly like you said it before. So you're lying. But when you tell the truth, you can go back and 10 years later and tell the same truth because it's true. Okay, our time's up for tonight. Next week, we're going to start at verse number 13. We're going to be talking about, we're going to talk about wisdom. And I want you to key in on, on James. We'll go back to chapter 1. And, and verse 5 says, If any of you like wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach and will be given to him. So we're going to talk about wisdom in, as it relates to your speech and as it relates to your tongue. So we're still talking about the tongue and the wisdom involved in using your tongue. So that's our lesson for tonight, and I look forward to completing chapter 3 on next week. Let's have a word of prayer. Father God, we come before you tonight to say thank you, Lord, for allowing us the privilege of getting together in your word, Lord, to learn how to be better people. Lord, help us to be conscious of our words and the things we say and how we say them because your word says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. God, help us to think about words before we say them and to know that this tongue is a little thing, but it can cause a whole lot of damage. So we need to learn, God, how to think before we speak. Thank you, God, for the lesson, and I pray that we will grow from that and we will move forward with the contention, a deliberate intention of doing better in the way we approach our, how we use our words. Thank you for this opportunity. We pray your blessings on everyone that's tuned in. And may again, may you be glorified by what has transpired tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. Good night.